The book of Genesis, chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. Well, you're turning there. I'll give you a little background since we're kind of dropping in right in the middle of verses 15 and 16 of what's going on. Many of you remember this story, have read this story uh, many times. Um, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And it's funny, we say Jacob and Esau, but Esau was the older brother. Usually you, you, uh, you name off siblings chronologically, but uh, they're always known as Jacob and Esau. And why is that? Because God had chosen Jacob before they were ever born. Matter of fact, if you study the scriptures, God chooses everything before the foundation of the world. It's all by God's choice. And we'll look into that uh, probably in a little bit out of chapter 9 of the book of Romans, but he chose Jacob to be the one through which Israel would be blessed. That, that uh, as a matter of fact, Jacob's name would later become Israel, and uh, his sons would be the, the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And um, the, the people today, the Jewish people today, those that are living in Israel and throughout the world, they're descendants of this family, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. But at one point, Esau had come in from, the, uh, from hunting. He was very hungry. Um, Jacob had made pottage of lentils, which uh, from my understanding is just vegetable soup. Uh, you can get a can of vegetable soup, fair, well, not anymore. You can't get anything cheap anymore, but uh, usually you, know, you can get it. But uh, he was very hungry, and he sold his birthright to Jacob for some soup, basically. Uh, why did that happen? Because Jacob valued it. Esau didn't. Uh, very, uh, very much yeah, the, the truth. He didn't value it. He said, what good is it to me if I'm dying? He wasn't dying. He was hungry. Uh, you know, you, you, sometimes you feel that way when you're hungry. You know, I'm going to die if I don't get somebody, something to eat. Um, expression I've heard that I've never heard before I moved down here, starved out. I'm starved out. But anyway, um, Esau was starved out, so he sold his birthright to Jacob and then as Isaac was an old man and his eyes were gone or very dim, his sight was almost gone, Jacob disguised himself as Esau. Esau being the older of the two was going to get the blessing, the, the majority of the blessing that Isaac had to bestow upon his children. Jacob disguised himself, received the blessing that was meant for Esau. And when Esau found out about it, he wasn't very happy about it. He was going to kill Jacob. So Jacob had fled. He was out in the wilderness. His mother had told him to go to where, my, where her family was from and to take residence with her brother and his family. And here he is along the way, and he's went to sleep with nothing but rocks for a pillow. You know, they, I don't know if you've noticed, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, commercials out there for this pillow and that pillow. Uh, nobody's trying to sell rocks for a pillow. So he's there and he's asleep. And uh, while he's sleeping, he dreams. And he sees... He sees uh, the angels of God descending up and down from heaven in this dream that he had. This ladder coming down to earth. And as he dreams and uh, he hears the voice of, of God. In verse 15, the Lord says unto him, Behold, I am with thee. And he, may, he said some things prior to this, but just for... for uh, 
the sake of the sermon, we're going to read these two verses right now. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again unto the, into this land, and I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you are in this place. Make us aware that you are in this place. Help us to realize the magnitude of knowing that we are in the presence of the Lord. We ask that you would draw your people closer to you. We ask that you would bring in any who were lost. Encourage us. Help me to preach this sermon. Give me your words. All these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus that you would receive the glory. Amen. Amen. This, I believe, you know, people think, well, <laughs> Jacob grew up. He, he was in the Isaac's family. He was in Abraham's family. J Jacob grew up. Uh, he was a, a saved man. Now, we don't really hear in the end of... Uh, a lot of those terms in the Old Testament, but there were people who were saved. There were people there that were predestined to heaven in the Old Testament as well as the New, but we see it expounded upon more in the New Testament because Jesus revealed to the world the plan of salvation. And many people think, oh, this was a, a Christian family. Isaac was a, a, a godly man. He was a man of God. And, uh, you know, Rebecca was his wife. Surely she was a, a, a Christian. Surely the kids were Christian. We, we have that problem even today where people think, well, I'm a Christian because, uh, you know, T Taylor Swift. I saw a video not too long ago. Uh, any Swifties in here? Uh, but... She made the statement, yeah, I'm a Christian. I grew up in the South. That was her reasoning, the fact that she was a Christian. But in any event, people think that they're a Christian, and I just uh, finished a book not too long ago about people under the delusion that they were Christians because they lived in a Christian nation or they, they came from a certain area or they belonged to a church, and it, it, it's all about some situation rather than faith in Jesus Christ. And that faith being demonstrated through a changed life. I don't believe Jacob was saved until Genesis chapter 28. I believe this is probably where he became a saved man. Now he had all the influences. He had, like I said, he had Isaac as, as a father. But here he was. He had been a manipulator. His, his very name, Jacob, meant uh, supplanter, which meant he, he was a manipulator. He was a con man. And uh, he was out there. He wasn't looking for God. You know, we, we preached a, a, a sermon last Sunday about seeking God's glory that Moses wanted to see. He said, show me your glory. He wasn't looking for God's glory. Matter of fact, most people are not looking for God. They are not looking for God's glory. I'll give you an example. I, just, I mentioned that sermon that I preached. Seeking God's glory, I believe, was the title. And we posted it on Sermon Audio. Sunday night, I preached another sermon out of Psalm 61. And I believe I gave it a, a, a title Sunday night, but when I got home and started to post it, I said, well, this is a better title. And it was called Help From On High. So I changed it to Help From On High, whatever the title I originally gave it. I posted that as Help From On High. So a couple of days ago, I'm pulling up Sermon Audio, and I'm showing my mom, you know, um, how different people from different states and different countries around the world have uh, listened to sermons preached here at this church. Not, not necessarily mine. I think there was about 34,000 
uh, listens to sermons that came out of this church. And I happened to look down at Sunday sermons. Seeking God's glory had, if I'm calling, and I may be off by a few, you know, I'm trying to recollect. I think 75 listened. 75 people outside of this building listened to that sermon. And that's a great thing. Don't get me wrong. You know, if it was 20, that would be 20 people that never heard the preaching out, out of the, that weren't, weren't here that day that heard the preaching. 75 people listened to that sermon, saw that title, clicked on that sermon, and listened to it. I think it was 201, 205 people listened to Help From On High. Why do you think that is? People want God's blessing. They don't want God's presence. They, 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 don't want God, they, they don't want to repent. They don't necessarily want to follow God. They're not seeking the glory of God. They're not putting it God first. But people want God's blessings. Even lost people want God's blessing. Jake was, Jacob was a manipulator. Jacob wasn't a righteous man. He wasn't looking for God. It wasn't happenstance that guided him to this place. As a matter of fact, it was the person in the presence of God that had directed all those things. A preacher friend of mine uh, told me when he was, he grew up in the church, and I won't, I'll try not to, slip up and reveal any names or anything. I don't, I don't think he would mind me telling who he is. But um, any event, he grew up in this church and uh, he was sort of like Jacob. He was a manipulator. He was a, a, a con man. He tried to get what he wanted as a, as a boy and as a teenager out of people. He would trick people. He would uh, try to take advantage of people growing up as a kid. As he became an adult, he was lost. He was lost. And uh, married a Christian woman, young lady at the time, married a, a, a Christian lady, and he was doing illegal things, he was doing immoral things, he was, uh, I don't think he was doing anything sexually immoral, but he was, he was not what you would consider a good guy. He was about to lose his wife. He was in danger from some dangerous people. And the Lord saved him. And the Lord saved him. And now he's pastoring that church where he grew up. And the problem was when... when uh, he was first candidating to pastor that church. There were people that remembered him as a kid, he felt. And maybe it was just his imagination. Because, you know, even though we're saved, we still have that, that feeling, oh, you know, you remember the things that you did. Even though God forgets your sins and, and God puts them away, he remembered what he did. And he felt that a lot of people in that church may not vote for him as pastor, not because of who he was, not because of how he preached, not because of a, his ability to pastor a church, but just because of the past that he had. I believe, and I believe the Bible teaches that Jacob was directed to that particular place at that particular time for a particular pur purpose. And that was that he would meet with God and God would, God would form a relationship with him. I was listening to um, Brother Collins preach. Uh, I like to pull up those sermons. I love sermon audio. Uh, Brother Joe Collins out of uh, Versailles there in uh, Faith Baptist Church there in Versailles. And he was talking about, uh, he hates that term when people say, make a decision. Make a decision. God is the one who makes the decision. God was the one who met with Jacob. He wasn't looking for God. God was, was, uh, came to him. 
Matter of fact, God had already been there. God was always there throughout Jacob's life. If you read David's 69th Psalm, Verses 7 through 10, and we won't take the time where, you know, I'm not going to preach an entire different passage, but I'm going to point out some things. 7 through 10, David points out that there's nowhere that you can go where God is not there. You know, we always say, I want God to go with me. Guess what? When you get there, God's already there. God's already there. There's no time. When God is not there. Not even in the womb. He said, said when he was in the womb. God had him covered. God was looking out for him. In other words he was a living soul. In the womb. God was already there. God was already understanding. He said if I, if I can ascend up to heaven. If I can go down to hell. You're there. And by the way, that word hell there, the, the word there used is not talking about the place of, of torments where the rich man went, where the lost will go. He's talking about the, that that was a term that was used. This was before Christ resurrected where Lazarus would have been. This was a place where they could see those that were in the flames. But in any event, he said, God, you're, you're, you're there everywhere I go. Verse 4, he said, there's not a word in my tongue that, that, thou doesn't, that you don't know. In other words, every idle word that we speak, God hears. Matter of fact, we, you might remember from Jacob's grandmother, Sarah, that he even knew her thoughts. When she laughed in, in, in her head. That she was going to have a child at her old age. She's like 90 years old. I hope my mom doesn't have a kid. 90 years old. Of course, that's because I don't want to split that vast fortune that she's, she's got. But in any event, um, she laughed in her head. God knows our words. He knows our thoughts. Verse 5 says, Thou hast beset me from before and behind. In other words, you're before me, you're behind me, you're everywhere I go, everywhere I've been, everywhere I will go. Thou hast searched me, verse 1 says, and known me. And even in this time when Jacob was a unrighteous, manipulating, lost man, God already had his designs on Jacob because he had selected him before the foundation of the world. Not just to salvation, but to be one of the fathers of Israel. The nation of Israel. He was the father of the children of Israel. Matter of fact, you'll know before, <laughs> you'll notice before that the Lord spoke to Jacob. Before Jacob spoke to the Lord, before Jacob came to faith in the Lord, and he quit relying on his own uh, abilities to manipulate and accumulate and uh, any other of the eights that you want to throw in there. The angels were already ascending and descending around Jacob. You know, people say, well, that, that's the place where it was. He just happened to come, or, or, or God had led him to the place where, where, where the ladder was. From reading my Bible, my understanding is, wherever he laid his head, those angels would have been ascending and descending. That's a marvelous thing. We don't think about that. We don't preach that enough, and, and I don't want to give undue glory to angels, but... God has sent them to watch over us, to protect us, to guide us, to direct us. And many times angels have intervened on our behalf at the will of God. So here he was. He was a lost man. He was in the wilderness. He was, uh, 
in an unsure situation. Behind him was someone who wanted to kill him. In, in front of him was a, a, a place. He didn't know where he, if he would be accepted. He didn't know how they were going to react to him. He, he didn't know if he was going to be a homeless vagabond or, or what the deal was. <laughs> and the Lord came to him. He said, I'm going to be with you. Once again, it wasn't because Jacob was a good man. I've heard preachers say this, uh, you know, I don't know if this is necessarily true, that, that Esau was probably a better man than Jacob was. Now, I do know the book of Hebrews says that Esau was a profane, a profane man, so I don't know if that's true or not. But in any event, neither really deserved the grace of God, did they? When you, when you get into these things and you look about, and you look where, I believe as Malachi says in Romans chapter 9, quotes that, it's that where the scripture says that Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And people say, well, that's not fair. Well, if it's not fair, it's because he should have hated both of them. Neither one of them deserved the grace, the blessing, the salvation of God. He said, surely... The Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. Lost people don't realize the presence of the Lord, how close he is. Matter of fact, many don't realize how close they are in death. The other day, was it last Monday? A fairly young man died on this road up the, in a motorcycle accident. I was saying and, and, and uh, uh, sharing with Hannah kind of uh, not very um, tactfully as a matter of fact you got to be ready he went out this morning not realizing this was going to be his last day on earth matter of fact many times we save people say the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. You ever get in a situation where you think, oh man, you know, you, 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 you've suffered some terrible tragedy in your life. You've suffered some loss in your life. You, you're, you, you, you've got some overwhelming problem and you're like, where is God? He's in that place. You just don't know it. You just don't realize it. He's before you, David said. He's behind you. He's there. There's no place where you can go where he's not there. There's nothing that you could say, nothing that you could do, no situation that you're in that he is not aware of. It. And not only is he aware, he's in control. It was a place of transgression. We're going to get into my sermon now. The place of transgression. Jacob was there because of his own actions. We've already mentioned he was there because, uh, he, he, uh, because of what he had done. He was on the run. His sins had found him out. He finally got to the place where his sins had caught up to him and he had to leave. He had to run. We mentioned the birthright and the blessing. Now, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know that the birthright thing was a, a sin. He, he made a deal with his brother. If anybody sinned, it was the brother for not valuing the birthright he had. But he manipulated and he lied and he tricked his father out of the blessing. Now we mentioned Romans 9. Let's go to Romans 9. And I promise this will... We'll go a little bit faster here the further we get into this. But Romans 9... Why was the Lord with him? Because the Lord had already selected him. Romans 9, verse 9. And this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done good or evil, 
the purpose of God, according to the election, might stand, not of works, but of him that called. I don't know how Armenians can read these verses and not this this is this is the chapter right here where I first came to understand that God had chosen me, that God had predestined me, that God had 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 saved me, that I did not choose him. I grew up believing, hearing preaching where they said, Well, you know, you make the decision, you call upon the name of the Lord. It's up to you. And and once you do that, uh then, then God will save you. No, it, it says it was according to his election, not because of my works, but because he, he called me. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. It is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. And we could go on and read the next 10 verses, but you get the point. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't there. He wasn't at the place where he met God because he was a godly man. God came to him as an ungodly man. God called him out. God saved him. God made his promises to him before Jacob ever did anything that he could even claim was worthy of salvation. You know, people claim they've done something worthy of salvation. No, it's all God. He was unrighteous and he was wicked and he was in trouble. And God lifted him out of it. Once again, it's probably uh, thoughts I had when I was listening to uh, a sermon the other day. And uh, I think it was the, the, the same sermon where, uh, it was, where Joe Collins said that he hated that term, make a decision. Make a decision. And he made this statement. People will say, well... God did all he can, could. God did all he could, and now it's up to you. God did all he could to save you, and now it's up to you. Jesus did all he could to save you, and now it's up to you. Here's a little something for you to chew on. God has never done all he could. Why is that? Because he's omnipotent. What can you, he can do anything. He can do anything, so he's never done, because he hasn't done everything, but he's done everything necessary for my salvation. He does everything to keep this world going in, to, according to his will. God has never done all he could. He could destroy the world. He hasn't done that yet. Now, he will destroy the world someday. He, he hasn't turn green into purple. He could. He hasn't done all he could. He didn't do all he could. He did everything necessary that we would be saved. It was a place of transgression. Here was a sinful man. Here was someone, didn't even know, I don't think, didn't even realize he needed God. He definitely didn't know that God was there. As a matter of fact, God had been there throughout his life. Before he was ever born, God was there. Didn't realize it, but God revealed himself to Jacob. He said, the Lord was in this place, and I didn't even know it. It was a place of tribulation. Now, we mentioned sometimes even saved people get in a place where, where, where we've got problems, we've got situations that, that, that have occurred to us. Here was a lost man out by himself. Well, wild animals could have attacked him. Thieves could have attacked him. Anything could have happened to him. He was sleeping with a stone for a pillow. And I don't know if there was a road or not. He was either out, uh, just uh, there, there, either he was there alongside the road or there was no road at all. He had nothing but the clothes on his back. Probably didn't even know where his ne ne next meal was going to come from. And God was there. Next time you have a situation, remember God's there. Angels are ascending and descending all around you. God is there. God's hand is upon you. Wherever you are, God is there. My sister has... 
something that's on her heart where she feels that no one should die alone. She got written up in the paper uh, years ago. I don't know who revealed it to the paper, but there was a man who didn't have a family, didn't have anyone. And he was dying there in the hospital. Her shift was over, but she refused to leave until he was gone. Because she's no one should die alone. We don't die alone. God is there. Amen. God is there. It, it, when we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, God is there. The first person we will see when we, when we cross to the other side is Jesus. God is there. Remember Stephen? Stephen was being stoned. Stephen wasn't a popular man on earth, but he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, welcoming him home. God is there. It was a place of tribulation, but it was also a place of transition. Jacob's situation was about to change. Now, he was still on the lamb. He was still going to meet with his uncle. See if they'd take him in. See if he could live there. And by the way, his uncle was probably a, a bigger manipulator and con man than he ever was. But God gave him the best out of this situation. God will change your situation. You say, well, God saved you and you're still ugly. Well, yeah, but I don't mind it. I don't mind being ugly. I heard a quote, I guess Lou Holtz had made this quote, famous football coach. Uh, somebody else was quoting him, something I was watching the other day, and he said that Lou Holtz said that life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you react to it. When you got God on your side, when, when, when God, God, you got God inside you, when, you, when the Lord is inside you, and you surrender to that, it makes a big difference. You, your, your circumstances, your situation may not change, but there is a transition because you are a changed person. And that's the next point. It was a place of transformation. Jacob was about to change. Look at verses 18 and 19 there if you're still in Genesis 28. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he put for his pillows and... and, and, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Not Bethel, Ohio, but Bethel. And it was the name of the city. That city was called Luz at first. Now Bethel means house of God. There was no house there. There were some rocks out there in the, in the woods or in the wilderness. But he said, this is the house of God. There was a transformation. The very first thing that he did was worship. Something's wrong with somebody who claims to be saved but never comes to worship. Never gathers to worship. God saved him and the first thing he did was worship God. As a matter of fact, a week or so ago, this thought entered my head. Remember when God sent... Moses to Pharaoh. And people say, well, the message was let my people go. That's what he told Moses to say, right? A little bit more to it. He said, let my people go that they may worship me. God releases us. God saves us that we would worship him. You know, that's the difference between clicking on a sermon that says, looking for God's glory, seeking God's glory, show me your glory, or how can God help me? I was telling Pi about it this morning. I said, I think I'm just going to, no matter what I preach, I'm just going to give titles like, uh, how to get God to give you what you want. We probably hit the million mark in no time at all. I could preach this sermon just say well, the title is how to get God to give you what you want and still preach the doctrine of election. Just That'd be kind of a Jacob thing to do, wouldn't it? 
I don't want to be Jacob. I want to be Israel. I want to be a prince that has power with God. When he stopped putting himself forward and pushing himself and started worshiping God, that was the transformation. That was Jacob's first altar. Some years ago, I preached on the altars of Abraham. That was the altar that his grand, the altars that his grandfather made. Here, he was making an altar, worshiping God there when there was nothing else around. Didn't have a nice building, didn't have padded seats, didn't have air conditioning, didn't have heat, didn't have anything but some rocks, and he worshiped God. Rocks and some oil. It's funny how he was, just hit me, why he was carrying oil. If I was on the run for my life, the last thing I would be doing is, is going, I better grab some oil. God probably worked that out too. Amen? Amen. It was a place of transformation. It was a place of trust. Verses 20 and 21. Jacob vowed a vow, saying, if God will be with me and, and will keep me in the, the, this way that I go and, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put, upon, uh, to put on, so I come again to my father's house in peace. Then will the Lord be my God. That doesn't really sound right with our doctrine, does it? If he does all this for me, you know, that, that, that's the gospel of today, by the way. If he blesses me, if he gives me all the stuff, if I listen to the preacher and he preaches a sermon on how to get God to give me everything I want, it's funny how the, the, there's all these plans. I was in half price books yesterday and I was looking, uh, there's all these prayer plans. Pray a certain way. Pray a certain way so you can basically manipulate God. The, the, the Jacob method, I guess it is. Understand this, Jacob... It was like a young Christian. He had just come to faith. He didn't understand. You don't understand the doctrines of grace when you're first saved. Some people have been saved for 60 years. They still don't understand the doctrines of grace. And what I don't understand, I still believe. Because God said it. It's not, if he does this, he'll be my God. It's like he's going to do this because he is my God. God blesses us. God has a practice or a past blessing. God, God blessed Jacob before this day ever happened. He has a present blessing. He met with Jacob. He has a promised blessing. He made promises to Jacob. God has promised that he would keep you, that he would lift you up, that he would uh, uh, put you in heavenly places, that, that you would be uh, in heaven, that you would be saved, that you would be cleared of all your sins. God promised of all these things. And there was a per uh, perpetuated blessing. In other words, the blessing kept going. The reason why he blessed Jacob and, and he blessed Abraham, he said all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. God blesses us that we would be a blessing to others. I was preaching out of 2 Kings a few weeks ago. Brother Raymond was here, and uh, down in that, further in that chapter was where uh, Elisha's bones were, and a man accidentally fell, and, uh, and, uh, or they went to bury this man. And he threw him in where Elijah's bones was, and he came to life. And Raymond was asking me about that. He said, I've never heard that preached. I said, well, I preached when I was preaching on resurrections a few years ago. I said, maybe you weren't here, or, but uh, I preached on the resurrections in the Bible. And I preached on that. And I, he said, well, what, what was the significance of that? What was it trying to teach? And I was like, wow, off the, the top of my head, I can't remember what it was. And I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, well, I'm going to go back and listen to it. But I was thinking about it the other day. And I think what the, what the point was that even after we're dead, we should have an influence, that we should have power, that people would look at our lives, that, that people would be affected by our lives, that our testimony would be some, uh, one that they would be made alive and they would trust God. There is a perpetual blessing. Today we are blessed because Isaac had a son who had a son who had a son who had a son who eventually had the... Uh, 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 out of that family. 
came Mary and Joseph, and God put his seed in Mary, the virgin. And that seed died for my sins. It was a place of trust. Now, like I said, he, he, he wasn't necessarily doctrinally correct. But he trusted God. And it was a place of trying. God had promised. Matter of fact, he said the, the, the reason why they're fighting in the Middle East is in the Middle East is God promised there that, that place that you are, that's going to be your land. It's in this chapter. God promised that land there where, where Bethel was. He said, this place is going to belong to you. And the devil has been trying to take that land from God's people ever since then. It was a place of triumph. He was destined to go to his father's house in peace. When God is present and God speaks to us and God brings us to a place of faith and there's a transition in our life, there's a transformation in our life, there's trust in him, we're going to go to our father's house. He's going to take us home. And in his house, there are many mansions. There are many mansions. He said, surely the Lord was in this place and I didn't know it. You know, the, the Lord is in this place right now. Some will never know it. Some will never feel it. Some will never hear his voice. But if his voice is calling to you today, if his voice is saying, repent of your sins and trust me, I would encourage you as Sister Connie comes forward, as you all stand and you take out your hymnals, Turn to number 168. I would encourage you to come forward. You may not have complete understanding.